on the agenda is public comment. I do not see any public. <laughs> so move on to the action items under number three. Can I add before you and get yes, into that? I would Thank like you. to add one item to the action items, please. Um, all of you have a copy of the minutes of March 28th, 2018, special meeting for the purpose of retreat for the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. We could do both minutes, I think, in one motion if someone mm -hmm. wants yep. to move approval of the minutes. So I'll approve. I make a motion that we approve the minutes of March 28th and March 21st, 2018. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, well, but wait. It's discussion. Oh, there was supposed to be discussion. Uh, well, <laughs> there's not usually, but it's, not usually. it's not a consent agenda, so. You're right. Um, which is the same as the March 21st minutes, which keep saying that I was absent. But you were there. But I don't think I was absent. Maybe I left the room for some reason? You left the room for a while. Did I? Okay. We got it. You did. You stepped out. Okay. Great. Well recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Well documented. Okay, so there's no no motions to amend. If you're comfortable with them, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Sorry, I will make sure we have discussion next time. Um, the second item on the agenda is the approval of the bleacher bid. Is that for Grant or for? Yeah, I can talk to it. Thanks. You, you all got the bid recommendation, um, and this is another kind of uh, good news item. The bid was actually just for bleachers here and at the middle school and for a gym curtain at the middle school in the hopes that maybe the bids would come in low enough we asked for alternates for a gym curtain here as well as the middle school and to, uh, to repair or replace some backboards here at the high school. So the uh, bids actually came in well enough to accept the alternates. So we're getting two sets of bleachers, two gym curtains, and we're getting um, the backboards replaced here. So all of that was within uh, the amount, and uh, the recommendation was to approve A-plus athletic products as the lowest responsible bid at $151,000. And we had 152 budgeted, um, budgeted for this. Was, were the high school curtains in the bond? No. no. As far as inside the gymnasium itself, um, without the locker rooms and surrounding, the, lock, the gymnasium itself, the only really, the only thing in the bond really related to the gymnasium itself was HVAC um, ventilation type of activities and the roof. Any other questions for Grant? A motion to approve the bond? We move we approve A plus athletic products it's bid for gymnasium work at the high school and the middle school. I'll second. Any discussion? All, right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There's a new teacher contract. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion for approval of the teacher contract? And that's for these? Is that what that's that's mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. I will move to approve the teacher contracts. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. You. you can pass the blue sheets into Ryan either Still. now or at the end of the meeting. Oh man, even reading D's. <laughs> I know, I'm just gonna <laughs> this. Just All right, we're moving on to the Veemers item and I'm not even gonna read the whole thing. <laughs> I'm just gonna, just yeah, gonna this, let you take it away. This is probably one in a long line of activities that the board is gonna have to approve or action items the board will have to approve as a new entity. Mm -hmm. So uh, both Roxbury and Montpelier currently offer Veemers as the retirement, um, but as a new entity, Veemers, requires that the board um, make a statement that says that they will 
allow administrators without teacher licenses to participate in Beamers under Group C, and all other eligible employees to participate under Group B. This is basically status quo. This is what we have, it's what Roxbury has, but since it's a new entity, they need something recorded that you have made that decision as well. So for anyone in the public who is following along and still awake, um, <laughs> <laughs> Beamers is the retirement system that our non-teacher employees participate uh, participate in, which is the Vermont Municipal Re Employees Retirement System. Mm -hmm. um, and on the bottom of the memo from Brian, carrying over the second page, is a language for emotion. If anyone wants to do that. I move to allow to allow administrators oh, without oh, teachers' oh. licenses to participate in Beamers under Group C and all other eligible employees to participate under Group B. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks. And then. This, the approval of the visit power of attorney and member agreement is next. So which you also have number two in that long line. <laughs> right. Um, and there will be more in future meetings. But uh, both Roxbury and Montpelier use the Vermont School Board's Insurance Trust for general liability insurance, uh, workers' compensation, and employment. Um, so whenever you do that, Visbit uh, gets a power of attorney and a member agreement uh, that. Roxbury has done as part of Washington South, and we have on file with Visbit for Montpelier. This is the ex these are the exact same documents that we already have on file with them, but unfortunately it's as Montpelier Public Schools. So they need the same documents, but as Montpelier with Roxbury. And so if, I assume we're fine with Visbit, um, I'm happy with them. Uh, so if we're okay with it, then you just need to approve the Visbit Power of Attorney and Member Agreement and authorize me to sign those documents and send them back. So we're on course to have our coverage as of July 1. So it's a trust that provides our, basically provides our liability and workers' comp insurance. And yep. a, a lot of school districts participate in. School board uh, mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most most uh, school districts use Visbit, I'd say probably 90% of the Yeah, I would say something in that regard. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I move we approve the Visbit power of attorney and member agreement and authorize business manager Grant Geisler to sign documents. I'll second. Any discussion of the Visbit motion? All those in favor? Aye. Any, Aye. any opposed? And this is, the next thing is what Grant talked to the Montpelier Board about briefly earlier, the approval of the Declaration of Intent to Reimburse Bond Expenses. Mm -hmm. And Paul Giuliani, who wears many hats, in this case he's Bond Counsel, uh, he recommends that uh, everybody who gets a bond should have a, an approval of Declaration of Intent to Reimburse Bond Expenses. What that allows you to do is, um, we won't get bond proceeds until probably sometime in July or maybe early August. Um, if we are incurring a lot of expense up until that time for architectural work or anything else that might happen, uh, if we have this declaration of intent to reimburse, then I could go back with bond proceeds in July or August and I could reimburse our, like our general fund or our fund balance and charge it to the bond. So I'm not sure we would do that, but I do want the flexibility to be able to do that. And I think there's language on that as well as far as the, uh, is there for the motion? Yeah. To, approve the, to yep. approve the declaration of intent. To reimburse expenses. Does the part proceeds. about Tammy legacy need to be in the motion? No, that's but it? we'll just, show okay. some, it's uh, okay. like, she, like she did for the last uh, bond related um, recommendation from Mr. Giuliani. So I move we approve the declaration of intent to reimburse bond expenses. Second. 
Any discussion on this motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And the last action item is the approval of the United People's United Bank resolution. And this is only one that, that we'll need. Um, we use People's United Bank for uh, a scholarship fund. And since we don't anticipate any activity on that account between now and July 1st, we can go ahead and transfer that from Montpelier Public Schools to Montpelier Roxbury. Um, and we will have another resolution kind of like this um, probably right near July 1 and you may not well I'll try I'll probably have you approve it right before the summer break mm -hmm. to get like our community uh, national accounts transferred as well but this is just <coughs> one of the bank accounts I think it's specifically for the court fund. scholarship yeah and I will need at some point to contact Jim Murphy because he'll have to sign this one eventually if you approve it. And it's long and drawn out, but they are very standard documents that I have reviewed. Grant, um, I'm curious. Yeah. Sorry. Ahead. The second page has a list of people who are authorized <laughs> signers. Question. Yeah. Shelley Quinn was the only name I recognized on there. Mm -hmm. Were those other folks with the bank, or were they? No, they are. Um, it's on the back of the front okay. on the back of the page. Those are those are I can let you know who those those are the members of our um, Crafters Edge team. Right. So the scholarship account is the Cory Fund, and then there's also one other account and it's Crafters Edge that we set up <clears throat> separately. Yep. And so those names are teachers within the district and that would apply <coughs> just to the Crafters Edge. The first page that just has Shelly Clinton and my name on it. That's, That's the one scholarship. for the scholarship. Okay. So different accounts, different. So Two it is different all. accounts. Those, and and the crafters edge is very small. Yeah. Those three teachers are our middle school special teachers. And I see now it's for crafter, depository. Which runs crafters edge as a business. So yeah. therefore has been. They make great furniture. <laughs> <laughs> Good program. And pies. And pies, yes, pies, yes. Do you guys know about Crafter's Edge? I don't know. You will. Well. <laughs> you will. <laughs> you will. I recognize the name. It's a really good so program. In, in the eighth grade, the each every year the eighth grade has um, a company that's called Crafter's Edge. At the end of seventh grade, the seventh graders apply for jobs in the company for the following year. They have to submit applications, they have to get references, they get interviewed, it's, it's sort of what, you know, how you get a job in life. And then they, um, they run the middle school dances as fundraisers. They sell um, baked goods and uh, you can order pies, you can order cookies, you can order quiches anytime from the kids who are cooking for Crafter's Edge. They have a big craft sale in the fall where they sell a lot of their uh, wood products. As Bridget said, you can get a lovely table. They have beautiful Adirondack chairs. They have cutting boards. There's something for every budget point. They'll make a drawer <laughs> organizer to your exact specifications of your drawer. And exactly. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, they do really good work. And they, uh, and they put on a dinner theater. Mm -hmm which is coming up at the uh, beginning of May, I think it's May 3rd and 4th, they'll be performing uh, the um, Madagascar, so if you know the movie Madagascar, they're putting on the play of Madagascar and they have a dinner and it's here at the high school and the community is welcome. You can buy tickets for the dinner and the show or just the dinner or just the show and they, the kids make a great, uh, usually Italian pasta, kind of dinner, but fancy-ish, sure. <laughs> it's not just a big bowl of spaghetti, it's a good dinner. And, uh, and they put on a great play. And at the end of the year, they can use the money that they raise through Crafter's Edge for an eighth grade trip. And they also um, choose some community organizations to donate a portion of their proceeds to. They give some money back to the next the seventh graders coming up as seed money for their crafters edge and they bring some of it to the high school for their class activities 
Thank you. More than you ever wanted to know, but it's a cool <laughs> program, it's really and Roxbury kids will get to do right. that. And you should all come to see Madagascar because it's <laughs> great. Especially King Julian. Not that I would know. Yes, <laughs> I understand. Oh, <laughs> well, there's yes. that. Awesome. All um, right. Any other questions for um, Grant about the bank before we? And if not, then I, I guess the res the um, motion would be to approve the resolution and authorize the chair to sign. And I will contact him to make that happen. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution and give permission to the chair to sign. Okay. Second. All those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Thank you for keeping us on track. <laughs> and also, the memo was great. Brian, thanks. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Grant. Thank you. All right. Bridget, can what I ask got? before we jump yeah, to the next section? Of course. So some of the policies we, policies we had listed for second reading, first reading, wasn't totally accurate. Does that make a difference how we start this, if we have to get that corrected now, or if it is OK to continue with the way they presented? Um, I think we should probably correct the second reading piece. Yeah, because um, some of that's, yeah. So what was it? The, it's the B, board member conflict C. of interest, B, C, board member code of conduct, yep. D, board superintendent relationship policies will be discussed tonight, but because we didn't reach them the last that's time. Fine. Oh, that's right. They're not so they're still uh, in first reading, right. technically. Okay, yep. be moved up to first reading. But shall we say that we do that, that we move them up to first reading? Mm -hmm. or you get, you Wait, can. We can. I mean, it doesn't. Because functionally, so the, the, the reality for this is there's no. There's no there's no minimum or maximum number of readings. Right. So if you read a policy on a first reading and there's no substantive changes, it can be adopted at the next meeting. The the critical part is that there's a ten day warning for adoption. So we can certainly be clear about what's first, second, or third, but ultimately it's not the, the most critical point for us is that we give the ten day warning for when they are ready to be adopted. I don't think it affects the order in which we take things. Okay. Um, and I, so just so, this is sort of outlined in the memo, but just so folks are, are clear. Um, tonight we're gonna to talk about the conflict of interest, code of conduct, and board superintendent relationship as a discussion. Those are really in a draft form and really just looking, looking for a fairly robust discussion and input on where we're going with those. Um, the, Everything else in the list under second reading um, are things that we have already uh, discussed. A, we need to revisit the inter-district school policy. It has changes, we're definitely gonna revisit. And then I think E, F, G, and H, substitute teachers, fiscal management, budget execution, volunteers, and work study students. We did talk about it at the last meeting. Um, we're not adopting them tonight because they had not been on the website. Um, and now they are my understanding yeah. um, mm -hmm. so yeah. they'll be up for adoption next week so we don't have to have substantive discussion on those other well they we actually can know people want to. Well, uh, I apologize they can't be up for adoption next week because that won't be within the 10-day warning so they'll be up for adoption at the first, first meeting in May. May right okay and then you had a question too? no I actually have a comment okay as I was reading through all of these policies today yes. I thought to myself, first of all, I wanted to thank you and Ryan and Steve on the policy committee for, this is a lot of work. But I was, it occurred to me that it's an unusual place to be in, to have a whole board read all of the policies that will be in existence before their in existence, which is July 1st, and it's an interesting thing to me. You usually get handed a big policy book, and maybe you look at a couple policies, but we will have read them all. So I thank you very much for that. Thank you, Tina. All right. Um, so I, I think we should start with the first reading ones. We'll start with those, and then um, we might switch around the order on the second reading. We'll see. But um, these are the three that we are looking at for the first time with the mm -hmm. new board. Mm -hmm. Alcohol and drug-free workplace, drug and alcohol testing of transportation employees, and prevention of employee harassment. Brian gave us all mm -hmm. an additional document which right. I somehow already managed. Steve if you need the here it is and the um, packet that's further up on the right is, 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 right right is right relevant right to 
No, I don't think. It, oh, is it? Yeah. Yep. It's relevant to the drug and alcohol testing for transportation oh. employees. Got it. Okay. So these I'll turn over to Brian. Sure. To so um, the these are from the um, mandatory list from the VSBA website. Lori and I went through these. They are similar to the ones that are already in effect for both Montpelier and Roxbury. There are no substantive changes that we are recommending to either one of these. Um, what I did want to point out, and that's why I gave you the extra packet, um, because the drug and alcohol testing is so minimal, I thought it would be helpful for the board to see what our current bus company, Student Transportation of America, does in terms of a comprehensive drug and alcohol testing program, with the caveat that we are out to bid for our next busing contract. So this for the time being is in effect while well, we are partnered and contracted with Student Transportation of America. Um, we will have something similar with whomever else we contract with if we end up not going with Student Transportation of America. Um, do they do random uh, drug tests? Yes, and that's do. covered in there. There are percentages by which they go, they um, review and go by, and employees must sign off on the randomness of the drug and alcohol testing. So I drive the senior citizen bus and they drive up in a truck and call out somebody like me to go in to be drug tested on a random basis. I don't know and if that's I how it works for SDA, but. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Okay. Um, the one about an alcohol and drug free workplace is really simply about notification of it. Um, if any individual is convicted or pleads no contendere, um, that would be a recommendation to you as a board, um, depending on the circumstances for dismissal. Um, and in terms of the prevention of employee harassment, um, again, very much boilerplate in both what Roxbury and Montpelier Public Schools already have um, in effect. So no substantive changes. So I have a question about the alcohol and drug fee. Sure. It's really just a clarification. Yes. This is a policy that governs people that work. In Correct. Buildings. It is yes. not relevant to students. No, but each building, specifically the high school, has its own drug and alcohol requirements, and those are listed in the handbook. Um, so yes, this is just for employees. That is correct. I was glad to see there's someone other than the principal you could report to, yes. lest the principal be who you are yes. reporting on. Yes, if we've had recently. We're not um, taking action on these tonight, no, so we're, we're not waiting for motion. So if anyone has well, questions, I'll just make sure we're comments going through or uh, questions anything? on the right. on the alcohol and drug fee comments on that policy? So, so just to bring up a comment, um, with my day job, we had to undergo a, a legal review of our alcohol and drug-free workplace policies in light of a couple of things, including anticipated legalization of marijuana uh -huh. and how that would affect potential drug testing um, uh -huh. after accidents or incidents. Um, as it turned out, our current policy, the attorney felt, was, was strong enough. But just to raise a flag, perhaps, that someone might want to take a second look at that. That, that, has, oh, a, that, that has a yep. better eye than. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate you bringing that. was not even on my radar. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Um, Any comments or questions on the transportation? Or the prevention of employee harassment? Yes, you see. Okay. I, I think the harassment was very thorough, so it seems really good. Thank you for the detail. This, the harassment one is fairly similar to the student harassment. We are required to have each one. Or each re yep. separate required right. policy. Just saying. Yep. Yeah. It's, yep. And procedures come with, again, much like the student one. So. Can I? Okay. I'm yes. sorry, on harassment. Is this? Does, is the legal standard on this for action by the district? Is that? Is that in statute? So, in other words, is this? This uh, under procedure. Um, 
you know, I, I'm not familiar with the harassment laws and, and how that plays out. I'm, I'm familiar with like bullying and that kind of stuff. And um, there's a there's a pretty uh, strong standard where the district must take actions. And that um, is the case. I mean, if you see the under the duty of invest to investigate, mm -hmm. we are required to investigate the harassment even if the complainant does not wish to proceed with a formal complaint. So it's it's essentially much like um, how all of our all of the adults that work within proximity of students are mandated reporters. Right. We are mandated investigators if we learn in some way that harassment may have taken place. Even if I approach you as the potential complainant and say it's understood from a conversation I had with Tina that this conversation was held and directed at you, you could potentially confirm it and say, but I don't wish for this to go forward. That it does not that will not deter my investigation. And would there be a set of procedures not written here that says how you do that? Um, I will tell you that anytime we've had either one of these, I've been quickly in consultation with our legal team and have outlined the procedures that we will take in order to do that. So it's done on a case-by-case -case basis? It's done on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, there is some. There is here. procedure in this policy, mm -hmm. right? I, I really like it. right, but it's not as maybe. it's not quite as detailed. Not as right. detailed. Right. 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 Yeah. And these yeah. categories are the um, employment categories for protection. Is that? <clears throat> I don't know if you recognize that this is mirroring the. Oh, the list of protected the state categories. Of protected mm -hmm. classes. I think these yeah. are the protected, these categories, are the protected categories, under categories under the public accommodation Nothing accommodation in clause? addition to it, in other words, or okay. I mean, I'm sure it's at a, at a minimum that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Looks good. These will be back on a future agenda. Mm -hmm. If there are no further concerns on these, I would propose that we warn them for adoption at the May. Second sounds like at the first meeting. Let's say the first meeting in May. Is that the will of this board for these three? I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Onto the ones yes. that are currently listed yes. under mm -hmm. second reading, even though we've moved things around. Um, why don't we? Do you want to talk about the transfer policy, Ryan? Sure. Yeah. So it seemed like a discussion the board had two weeks ago regarding the district elementary school transfer policy was we like the direction, we want more specifics in there, make it very clear cut in terms of what to expect. Um, so that's what we put forward for the second draft that's in front of us tonight. Is Again, kind of that same theme that we're, at this point in time, not anticipating students transferring regularly between elementary schools. Um, so we outlined what parents might expect to see if they were to ask to do so. Um, and the section where the line is drawn through it, you're taking out. Correct. Is that correct? Let me look. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are deletions. Yes. And so, and since I didn't hear the discussion last time, mm -hmm. the, the question I has, have is, it says the Board of School Directors will consider parent requests for in-district transfers. Does anything happen before that? This does not indicate. In other words, if I am a parent and I wish a transfer somehow to my student, does something happen before it comes to us? Good question. Good yeah, question. so a lot of the other policies, um, and again, even the conversation the first time around, a lot of the districts that we looked at, or that I looked at, I drafted this policy regarding elementary school and in-district transfers, they allowed it. So their policy was much more in-depth in terms of details on how that's implemented and who does what. Um, so those districts who would have had essentially an expected transfer of students between buildings had pretty much everything geared towards the superintendent or the administration. Um, geared toward them, meaning they were making the decision. Right, things weren't coming, the decision wasn't coming to the board um, in those districts who were expecting a lot of transfers. Um, and so <clears throat> they were different there, but no, we don't have anything in terms of, well, 
you know, I've personally been asked. Um, <laughs> you know, we don't have a policy on it yet, but um, you know, we had a conversation. But you're right, there's no procedure. There's nothing to tell us that we should send them to the principal or we should send them to the superintendent or write a letter to the board for what to do. I mean, we usually take mm -hmm. advice from the administrators. Mm -hmm. And if they hadn't been consulted, for example, it would be hard to get advice. Right. So is it, so maybe just put some more specifics in here in terms of how requests should be sent, how they're handled, would that be? That's what I was thinking, what's the rest of the board yeah. thinking? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, I think it might, just simply adding something like uh, that the board shall act on the, or shall, uh, you know, act on the recommendation of the superintendent or shall, you know, something like that. If, if the board wants to retain authority to make the final decision. But the other thing is that, I mean, effectively, this is a, per, this is a, a policy of permission. So it's saying we will do it. Um, it doesn't quite say that. It says we will do it if these things are met effectively. Right. So we're, we've changed this around. Instead of saying we're not doing it, we are doing it. Yeah, um, I mean, does anyone? I, I mean, I'm not sure we resolve that either way. Maybe, you, Ryan, you have a memory of that. But it feels like if we're saying yes, it's OK. I mean, I, at the big, the big caveat, or the big if you want to circle one phrase in here, it's student needs. Students' needs are is a very large, undefined um, issue here, and so it still leaves us with that um, subjective standard that somebody's going to have to weigh against the other stuff. So and maybe that's why we want it, but it's a pretty big hole. Yep. Yeah, I guess I'm concerned that we've lost the concept that it would be only in extraordinary circumstances mm -hmm. because it's. Yeah, it doesn't I mean, read that way. It doesn't read, I think sure. it does kind of read now like this is something you can ask for. And if you make a request, uh, we need to tag it to the board. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone think, I, I just want to keep pursuing the issue that Tina does anyone think it should be the superintendent's decision and not the board's decision? I mean, I think anything we tell, we put in policy as a superintendent's decision could probably come to the board if the person disagreed with it. Right. But it would, be, it would be someone coming to us mm -hmm. saying they disagreed with the superintendent's decision well, yeah. as opposed to coming to us to make a decision. Honestly, I hadn't really thought about it. Well, I was just thinking how it read to me the first time was, I want to transfer my child. I'm going to the board. Mm -hmm. That's the way it reads. Mm -hmm. We don't let anything like that happen without the, the process yep. how you get to the board. I'm not yeah, saying you right. shouldn't come to the board. I think you should eventually, yep. perhaps. But why wouldn't somebody else have solved this problem before right. that? Well, yeah, so we, I did have a similar. We could do it yeah. similar to the tuition mm -hmm. waiver thing, where right now, if somebody requests a tuition waiver for 60 days, I think Brian can approve it. But for longer than that, Brian actually brings it to the board if he is going to recommend that it should be approved. So it might be that they make the request to the superintendent who will then forward requests that have merit to the board for approval or, I don't know. Mm, either way, that's a, the board making the decision though. Because it shall have merit right. or whatever that phrase yeah. we want to use is, uh, someone's going to just appeal that it has merit. Right. So it's coming up. I think what Brian was at least nodding his head at last time when we were discussing this was give, a, give some more structure about what standards we're using for uh, approving. And student needs is maybe as strong as we want to be, but you know, this is saying it's all good as long as we can demonstrate all of these things. That the capacity of the school is there, the staffing will work, the student has a need, the transportation works, and the class sizes work. As long as all that happens, it happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I would read this if I were a parent. Mm -hmm. And I think in most cases, we're going to be able to do a few a year if we do that. And is that is that what we want? And then they stay in that, and then they stay in this in the school till they matriculate from that school, which means that then we build a new capacity around that new being able to predict that new student body size moving forward. And then perhaps the next year there are more coming in. Now some may matriculate out. So, but I just don't know what our what our objective is in terms of preserving the the school at, at Roxbury also as a, as a I mean, community I, school. Right. Well, is, is that should that be added in some way to the consideration if we feel strongly enough about that? If right. 
10 people decided from Roxbury they wanted to go to Union, there's a real problem. Well, Bridget had a, that would be the just alluded to this. Well, last time we talked about this idea of the extraordinary student need somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, that we were going to make the decision based on student need. We we're going to make everything up. We we're going to part the waters for a student who has, a, who has the need. We're not, going to, we're not going to let anything stand in the way if, they, if there's an extraordinary student need. But that's a pretty high bar. And if we could figure that out, because we are one district, we're going to take care of students the very best we can. No problem with a transfer if it really is an extraordinary need of some sort. And we don't, how do you define that short of, you know, how do you define that? Well, we as a system might recommend transfer for extraordinary needs. Special ed might recommend it for something. I, this no, policy right. that is not about that. Right. Oh, what? Oh, you could all write it down. Special, ed, was, special ed, that decision would be made in the IEP IP team, team, and that would be something that this board would right. honor, I'm confident. Yeah. Um, and I, I agree with Steve with all the points that he is making. I, I think the, I, I would be cautious and would, would um, suggest perhaps that the board think about, at least in the beginning, a higher standard, um, simply because there is a commitment mm -hmm. to preserving the, the community at, at the Roxbury Village School. And I, I think, um, I think I'll, I'll say this, and I'm sure this will resonate with Tina as well as anybody else who's been in the classroom. I think it's always easier to start off a little stronger than you need to be and, and back it off a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you find out that, that's, that you're having too many requests that you can't honor, as opposed to having it be a little looser and then try to, you know, like to Steve's point, oh, we have 10, now we have to make this stronger because we are, we are struggling with the capacity issue. Um, that, that's just something for, for the board to consider because I know that this board's commitment to the viability of the Roxbury Village School as part of this, as part of this merger. I have a suggestion. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if before between the first sentence and the second sentence if we said something like um, in extraordinary in in some extraordinary instances the superintendent may recommend that it is in a student's best interest to be served in a different school then the board of school directors will consider that recommendation and decisions will consider but are not limited to, et cetera. That's good. So it stays with the students when it doesn't come back to family, so that's good. Um, Did we already resolve that one? We didn't want it to be extraordinary family or student right. situation? I just said mm -hmm. in extraordinary, there may be extraordinary cases in which the superintendent may recommend that it's in the best interest of a child or may find that it's in the best interest of the child too. You want to use that standard? That wasn't what you said the first time. I'm pretty sure. You said <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. I think that the, no, uh, the superintendent may recommend that a student would be best served in a different school. Or I definitely didn't say that. I said no. The student's did. needs would be. It, or it's in the student's best interest. I think I, I said so. Yeah, I probably stopped writing too fast. <laughs> Superintendent well, the Baber. word extraordinary but and I, best interest to me are two different things. Right. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm saying it's extraordinary because it's very unusual. It would be a very unusual circumstance for the superintendent to find that a child has to be served in one or, you know, in a specific elementary school. We want to convey that that's extraordinary, mm -hmm. non-ordinary. So, as a board, we're saying we would do this transfer only in extraordinary circumstances. If the superintendent mm -hmm. recommended it to us on the basis of it being in the best interest of the student. And we're not going to try to preview what all those circumstances might be. It's better to leave it mm -hmm. simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be like, it's like if there are extraordinary circumstances, then potentially a child's best interest would be met <laughs> at this other school. But you can't have the best interest separate from extraordinary circumstances. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that is that approach generally working for folks? Mm -hmm. right. Okay. So then we'll bring back a draft that has mm -hmm. things going to the superintendent first, mm -hmm. highlighting extraordinary circumstances staying focused on 
students, not families. Um, I think from the decisions point on that's all good, personally. Mm -hmm. transfer. So would we like to keep it? So right now, if someone were to be granted a transfer for whatever the circumstance was, would we like to keep it that they stay in that school until they move on to middle school, or do we think it makes sense to have them just for the remainder of that academic year? No, I think if you I think we want them to stay put so that we yeah, can you don't plan for that. Back 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 That's why we stuck yeah. it that way this time. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I'd like the idea that there might be extenuating circumstances. Because <coughs> the extraordinary circumstance could be a short term. Thing. It could change. Like, so right. right. We might have room yeah. for that, but not in the normal. Yeah. Any other input on this? This is a tough one. Mm -hmm. So we'll have another draft of this at the next meeting, and I'll label this as a third reading. Are people okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So you also have in front of you these um, drafts. Uh, policies that are part of kind of the core governance policies for the board and that's the board superintendent relationship the board member conflict of interest and the board member code of conduct I'll talk briefly about the board superintendent relationship and then um, Ryan is really more responsible for the conflict of interest and code of conduct um, the First of all, disregard the numbering. I, I just tend to numbering things one when I draft things because we don't have a packet of policies together yet for governance <laughs> policies. But so the board superintendent relationship is, in, is, is a stab at redrafting that um, provision that we have in the MPS policies, which is called that, and sets up the, the division of labor between the board and what's delegated to the superintendent. Um, so it's a stab at redrafting it in a way that is uh, shorter, is not phrased in the negative, the way the classic policy governance policies mm -hmm. are drafted. Um, and otherwise uh, tries to, um, I guess try, tries to, you know, just Expand a little, or expand a little bit on the evaluation piece. So I'll, I'll start at the beginning, and, um, uh, in terms of what's similar and what's different. The um, one, the board would direct the district's operations only through the superintendent. That's pretty similar to um, the classic policy governance mm -hmm. model. Just pulling it up. Um, the board acting only as an entity is certainly, you know, we talked about that at the retreat. That's a very similar concept. Um, the board supervises the superintendent and not district staff. Again, that is also, you know, basically the way the policy governance model works that you're um, working through the superintendent. Uh, the board role in hiring, dismissal, and discipline, that's just an effort to simplify what's in the current policy. Then there's the section on, because the, the board's most important role is to create policy, that part is really still a work in progress for sure because we haven't really talked about how we're going to structure the policies in this district, Well, I was in the new district. So we have some it, questions. When I read there. that one, I thought, well, we can't really do that one until we decide what our model of governance is. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we made a lot of progress towards that on the at the retreat, right? We so, did, but, um, you know. At some point, like you have to policies. start right. figuring, no, you know, it all sort of fits together. <laughs> It's so kind of a jigsaw puzzle to piece it all fit together. But right, we need to make more progress on what kinds of policies we envision having. Um, and I would flag under 1.4, you know, this discretion piece. This, again, it's phrased differently. It's because it's not using that negative phrasing from the policy governance model. But it's the same concept that the superintendent gets to interpret the policies and adopt any reasonable interpretation of the policies. And that's part of the delegation of authority. Um, 
to that to that language there under 1.4 near the end the board must respect and support decisions made by the superintendent that reflect a reasonable interpretation of an existing ends or operational policy even if the board or its members may have made a different decision I that's guess. that's basically saying if if it's a reasonable way to interpret the policy it goes do we define reasonable anywhere? It, that is not defined in the current policy. It's a very good question. What was the question? Yeah. Is the word reasonable defined anywhere? Um, yeah. I got confused the first time I read that one. And I wonder if we, I, I don't have it right now, but if we want to think of different wording for the very last bit of that section, because it says, even if the board or its members may have made a different decision, which when I, the first time I read it, I read the board has to respect the superintendent's decision, even if the board made a different decision. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying even if the board in the shoes of the superintendent might have come to a different conclusion, it's not. That's exactly what it means. And right. It, and so yeah. I think we and need a different phrasing there because we don't want to say the superintendent can make a decision even if we already made a decision. Which is not right. 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 Or that we've declared some yeah. decision and the superintendent yeah. can make an entirely different decision. Right. It's right. easy to get stuck on this one um, because the language can make it seem almost an unimpeachable decision. And I don't think we want that standard either. Uh, or maybe we do, maybe we must have that standard. But my sense is that what we want is the superintendent to act without a bunch of second guessing and, and negating of, of authority, but where is the standard at which point we say it's the unreasonable, is that the standard, when it's no longer reasonable? That, that, right. that is, a, I mean, but it's up for discussion, right? Like right. that, so right. that, is that this is starting from the policy governance model, and yeah, that would be the policy governance That was standard. an unreasonable decision. Yeah, and in fact, what, you know, an interesting point that you take from the policy governance model is, is that they say you have to really, it really is any reasonable interpretation. If you're thinking in the back of your mind, we're just giving them discretion because they're going to do the right thing, you're not doing it right. Because mm -hmm. that's like you're thinking that there's some standard that you would apply to what would be reasonable that you're not putting in the policy. So it's, it isn't about they get discretion because we trust them to do it right. It's we've set, we've set the policy. We've said as much as we feel like we need to say, and anything that falls under that policy that's a reasonable version of it is okay, because mm. we've given them discretion to do that. But if somehow they didn't follow the policy, then you would be- That's a different story. That's a different story. Okay. How about- uh, And by reasonable, the carvers might mean like, not illegal, right. not sure. evidencing sure. mental illness, not <laughs> causing <laughs> actual harm, and, yeah. but anything above that bar is, so a good yeah. example of how this plays out in reality is where Brian comes to us and says, hey, I'm about to make a decision on something. I just need a little guidance first, right? And he goes off and makes a decision. We're really happy he came to us and asked us about that first. And he probably is too, because now he's got, he's got his discretion, but he's also got like, he kind of knows where not to go practical. But he doesn't have to do that. And, um, but sometimes if he doesn't do that, he feels like he gets burned. And Brian is just a placeholder at this point because I'm not picking on him. I'm saying a superintendent might feel this way. So he does it because he's smart and he's, and he's thinking about not stirring up a hornet's nest unnecessarily. But we're saying, you don't, don't do that. You don't need to do that, basically. Or if you do that and we give you a guidance and you ignore it and it was still reasonable, or doesn't get to come back and say, we just had a discussion about this. Because we had a discussion, but he can ignore it. And we can't then spend the next meeting saying, why did you ignore us? And so I'm just wondering, like, are yeah. we good with this? Is this really where we want to be? This is the time to have that conversation. Right. Yeah. Right. This is the time to have that conversation. You know, we, you, that doesn't have to be in the policy at all. Yeah. It doesn't have to be framed that way. It is good to define it's, the idea that when we, when we delegate authority under a policy, we've truly delegated it. We've truly let go of it. And I think reasonable standard is, that's the idea of that, is we've truly let go of it. And we haven't held it just tight enough to be able to fight him, fight him or her. I would agree. I, however you choose to go with this, I, I would simply suggest that you're clear what is truly the superintendent's work yeah. and what is truly the board's work. And, and however, again, strictly or, or 
for lack of a better word, at 8.30, loosely you want to define that, it should, because you do, to Steve's point, you want the individual to have the freedom to say, this is the policy the board gave me, this is the work that I can do within the policy, I'm gonna go and do this work. Um, or, conversely, this is not, you know, I do have to check in, or I, you know, whatever the actual parameter the board is comfortable with extending, be clear where that line is. Or where we say now, we say, could you please check in before you make that decision? You could be like, no thanks, right? And that might be fine, and we need to stop asking in effect. So, you know. But likewise, I'd say, the superintendent shouldn't come and ask us our opinion if, if the superintendent doesn't intend to listen to that opinion. Under, the, under though, this policy, he can. I know, but I'm just saying, as a matter of practice, yeah. you wouldn't want to have a discussion with the board who said, we think you ought to do this, and then you go off and do that. Why ask? Well, Just do it. You could say, as a purely advisory discussion, I'm asking you all for your opinions. I would need some guidance on this, but I retain the right to make this decision, and I want to make that clear at the beginning that I'm going to make this decision, and I may disagree with what you advise me, but I want you. I would still like to hear your advice. Uh, you're my counsel. Well, if you're that I mean, that seems like an odd thing for superintendent. It is. I mean, I might do that. I might say, look, I get to make the final call here, but it doesn't mean I don't want some opinions. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yes. Seems politically dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like a killer to me. <laughs> Just do it. So I mean, that's what that's the place we put someone in when we say this. The only standard is that it be reasonable, unless we want to say and in consultation with the board or after having heard the counsel of the board or you know and then then all of a sudden you're starting to erode that that mm -hmm. autonomy and authority. There's, do we have? Um, Model policies for these, or other districts' policies, or the model policy for this kind of thing, yeah, is the is the Carver model, which is oh, what yeah. we have in the MPS. Okay. With I all mean, the negatives, with all the negatives, that's the model that for VSBA this. provides. Um, no, the VSBA doesn't do this in the same way at all. It's okay. it's very very different. Well, we and we don't have to go. So we don't right. have to go this route, or we or you know we could. But we could look at what they have for how to draw that line, if they. It's, it's really not. It's really different. It's really different. I mean, it's really not. They don't have a policy that, I think, puts the, outlines the categories the in quite the same way. Because huh. um. they're big into that delineation, you would think they would have a description of how to make it. I wonder what the intent is there. I, I, don't think I would read what they have, the right intent on. being that it's more policy by policy, maybe. You looked at what their, their model was? Well, they don't have this policy. I mean, this is not how they structure the policies. This, the concept that the Carver model has of the, the board superintendent relationship, here are the limitations, yeah, and here's the governance. Right. That, the VSBA doesn't right. set that up. Right. Right. It's right. just a totally different framework. Can, Can I? Oh, go ahead. I, I looked up Orange Southwest is a neighbor of ours, and they're pretty close to policy governance. The way that they've structured it, at least according to what I could see quickly, as long as the superintendent uses any reasonable interpretation of the board's ends and executive limitation policies, the superintendent is authorized to establish all further procedures, make all decisions, take, you know, essentially they're, they're as strict as it can go. So if you don't, you don't have to necessarily go that far, you know, so you could take this, and I could send this to, to you and uh, Ryan if you're interested. Um, you know, you could go, I mean, instead of, I'm trying to think of how you could help here, instead of just any reasonable, um, I don't know, help, somebody could help me words well, with this. maybe a reason, it's really the reasonable interpretation of what, so it's the policy and the board's, um, the board's current temperament, I mean, it's really what it is. It's both those things. So you're taking a policy, and then you're kind of taking a temperature reading of the board and saying, I made a reasonable determination based on that. The question is, if, how do we codify a temperature taking process? Right. And I don't know that you can do that. If we really hone in on the operational policies as part of this, we're talking about, I mean, all of that work has to be done under operational policies in terms of what, how much structure do we give? And I think Bridget said it really well, is that you kind of have your piece, you have your say when you build your policies. I agree. So, 
you build your policies as thoroughly as you want to guide the superintendent, and then you stop. And if you feel like, boy, the superintendent really blew it on that one, it's like, well, let's write a new policy next time, and not, and you know, but until then, we don't get to change it. And so, if we were to look at our operational policies as our hard work in this, and leave the reasonable standards so that there's a, there's at least at the end, there's a line that everyone can follow, which is, look, you delegated it to me, that's it. I didn't. I did. I, I did something reasonable under what you delegated, and you were you were mute. you didn't say anything about that. So I mean, think about this as budget creation time. That's kind of how it's, it's like it's yeah. chaos, right? If mm -hmm. you don't, and how do you create policy operational policies that guide your? You don't create budget. But, but that's. I mean, you've been working on that, Steve. That we're hoping to bring before the board a budget policy that is not like any policy the MPS board had before. Right. right. That would put more specifics into the expectation and the process right. so, so that's more so that the board would be reading. creating it right. creating those expectations through a policy that says this is what we expect but do we to only see. do that during budget building and do we not do that during other types of building i think you i don't i think that's entirely up to the board right because um, it's a very specific operational policy it's a, basically yeah. the budget policy is an operational policy I guess we could do that for adopting new policies. We could have an operational policy on that and, and that walks us through more carefully. Or any other policy, we could add as much detail as we want. And I think what we identified early on was that we at least have to do that for the budget policy, because that one has been a train wreck. And I so, think to your point, I think you would then be able to quote unquote limit or expand your definition right. of reasonability based on the policy that you write. You know, so so that that could almost be the temperature taker there. I mean, you could you could craft a budget policy that says the superintendent shall not bring a budget that exceeds that. You know, you could draw the line in the right. sand right there. Or shall consult. Or shall, right. Or or how to actually yeah. do it. Yeah. And then the reasonability is well, it says you shall consult. You did not consult. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it that becomes less black and white based on how you craft it. I'm getting comfortable with the standard of reasonable. Knowing that it leaves a lot of work in the operational policy creation sphere for us. And what VSBA's super board superintendent relationship policy says, it says a bunch of stuff like, we'll be nice to the superintendent and his office staff, um, which is a good idea. But to this point, it says that the board directs the superintendent through written policies that prescribe the results the board wants to achieve. Um, Results, right. not the process. Prescribed results. Mm -hmm. But still, the you're. I think you. I'm. A, I'm saying the same thing, Steve. That it's all about what we set out in the policies. The extent of the policy is what creates. Like the more detailed the policy is, the more constrained the superintendent mm -hmm. is. The more broad the policy is, the more we're delegating decision making. Or you could even just say the the. I, the way that I could even see you continuing to use the word is you're limiting the scope of reasonability. You know, so, right. so there's either more interpretation right. or less. The more we put in, the, we, the tighter we make the fence or the bigger we make the That's fence exactly is right. all about what we put in the policies. Unless we want to have, I mean, if you say anything other than this reasonableness thing, then you're creating a new, you're creating something outside of yeah, I'm so fine with reasonable now. Oh, yeah. yeah, I feel better about it now. You're, you, if you didn't say that, you would almost be creating a weird, like, gotcha category where you're yes. like, which is not the superintendent has to carry out all the policies, except we can at any time say that. That's not what we want. That's it. Right. Yeah. That's, it. Yeah. Right. That's it. It's the universal clawback. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 So we don't, I don't think we want that. Um, in the current NPS policy, also in this board superintendent relationship policy, which is here in 1.5, is the monitoring piece, mm -hmm. which we did not really get to at the retreat in terms of talking about whether that's something we see as part of the in the parens at the bottom where you've got a question I'd substitute all mandated policies you've got everything else handled but right but you would say that there should be monitoring on all the policies which is well not you've got ends 
compliance with ends operational and all mandated policies. In other words, all mandated policies plus the LED Actually, those are the ones that, that must be I don't know what monitoring. It's, it's an interesting point because mm -hmm. that's not under the NPS board. They, I don't, the things that we think of as the mandated policies weren't really in the work plan for no. monitoring right. because no, we were only monitoring the ends and limitations. Yeah, right. yeah. Uh, but I would think the mandated because the ends maybe it was just tariff the goals yeah. right. and the limitations mm -hmm. were just like um, compliance with. Yeah. Some of them touched yeah. on. Yeah. And you wouldn't be able to do all of them at once. I, I think it would be a good idea to set up a schedule. So the thought that I had, which I put in here um, for discussion, was if, if folks want some plan of monitoring to continue as part of the way the board works, that instead of putting the monitoring schedule in a policy, we should commit to that being part of the work plan that we adopt every every year. There you know, the flexibility. We have an annual schedule. There's a point at which we're supposed to start the annual schedule, which in theory could be May, you know, for the next year, and you start it. And at that point, we would say, like, this is the end policy we're going to do this year. Or we're going to do all the ends this year. You know, we're only going to do one, or we're going to, you know, whatever it is, we're going to do it. And, and the, that's what the we're going to do this year. The previous calendar included all the ends and all the limitations. <coughs> Yeah, and my sense is that we couldn't do all that. Was we that couldn't good? do... Like, it was well, really hard to do it all. The big problem with the ENDS was that before we did an ENDS report, we were trying to define the ENDS indicators, and that was what took a huge amount of time, because we didn't have indicators. For the superintendent to bring back. Yeah. 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 Um, the limitations were pretty straightforward. The review, the mandated policy thing is just a little weird, because, you know, so Brian has to report on, are we in compliance with the alcohol and drug-free workplace? Does it tell us to do anything? You know, or like, the trans are we in compliance with the transportation policy? Yeah. Well, what would, that, says what that, would that report look like? It says that the board must systematically monitor the superintendent's compliance with. That doesn't, that doesn't necessarily say to me that he has to give a report on every single one of them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it allows you to do some monitoring on any of them if something would come up. I mean, some of the things that occur to me, that, and I, I don't know how we would operationalize this, but one, one is, are they being updated? Yes. That's like that's yes. something. Right. Um, are things like the right, having the right person to be the reporting, like, you know, we've updated who the report person is based on turnover. Um, you know, some of the other things mm -hmm. like that that change in the yeah. policies, like is some, that's what do, I we know we're keep, we're, do we know we're keeping them up to date and how that's is that, point. that's primarily the superintendent's job, how could, the, how would the board sort of well, put in place its the VSBA, role of making sure that's happening? Yeah, the VSBA gives us all, at the end of each legislative session, they tell us all the changes that will affect our policies mm -hmm. and we should put it on our calendar to review that and then schedule updates Policy work. that should come out in you know July or August probably every year yeah. so all that likewise I don't think needs to be in the policy it's just part of our procedure of how we would do that and I and I like what you wrote about it and this um, and then there's also, this is a very much a, um, a rough stab. Tina also looked at this, um, something about the evaluation process, which is very bare bones in the current MPS policy. Um, this, this language is really a departure from the Carver model because, you know, in the Carver model, the superintendent's performance is the performance of the district. So there you go, go away and evaluate that. Um, this was an effort to come up with something more to put some, you know, details and framework around yeah. um, around an evaluation. I think the effort here was. I love this. I think that the effort here is just you look at the performance of the district, but you also look at the, the process of managing the district, sort of the the work of the managing process, which is separate from the performance outcome, um, and they both have to be very good. You have to have a high level of 
involved. And so I think that this kind of points to that idea, and, and you've, you've actually just created a detailed laundry list almost here. Right, it's but basically a laundry list. Which is certainly more clear than the category of shall be evaluated on management process, which is kind of, to me, too, too vague to be meaningful. And it's in a positive manner in preference mm -hmm. to all those yeah. negative mm -hmm. things that yeah. I thought told us. I think it looks pretty good. The first sentence is the one that comes out of Carver, and it's, um, is it clear to folks what that means? Because it's, it's this, in, the, in the Carver model, it's a big sentence. Right, right. It's like, they, they, it's like a, a, a mathematical equation, which is the two are equal and there is no other, fa there is no other factors, variables in them. And this adds new variables. We want, I actually hadn't thought about this, but before the retreat, reviewing some of the Carver stuff, you know, Carver would really emphasize that board's evaluations of themselves is really important also. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is. We that's don't a have different policy, I think. It yeah, is. That's, in, um, we that's don't what's that. now in like 4.4 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. 4. of the, the board. Mm -hmm. um, but but that whole section 4 is the board's governance process. The governance. So that's yeah. what that would fall into. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we Good. should do that. I agree. Mm -hmm. We should definitely do that. We yes. have done, but yeah, not yeah. recently. Mm -hmm. yeah, so those ones were fresh in my mind, so I'm just yep. it's out there. Right. Would you, could I ask yep. kind of a semantics question? 1.1, the opening sentence, only decisions of the full board acting as an entity are binding on the superintendent. Do we need to include full? Yes. Or should it? Actually, we do. Yes. Does that make sense, or would it just mm -hmm. be the board? Because Entity. are you concerned that full suggests it has to be everyone? All nine as members, opposed yes. to a decision of the board? Based well, on see, the quorum. that's not unanimous. Well, the board acting as an entity is entity. Right. Yeah. So maybe we could take board out. So that'll, full out. Mm -hmm. yeah, I wasn't sure if it was an issue or if it might be a concern, but it, it, it did it catch my attention. It has to be unanimous. Yeah, it did yeah. catch my attention it whenever I read that, it the first it? time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because if you take even if you take out full, the next sentence makes it clear. Right. Right. What you're talking yeah, about. You could not. take out full only decisions of the board acting mm -hmm. as an entity. Right. This, by the way, that second paragraph is a. Um, it's new. Isn't it? it is new. Mm -hmm. I think there were pieces of it in the Carver policy, pieces of it in the VSBA policy, and um, I may have even found them somewhere else. But the idea is to. Actually, the VSBA policy has options on this issue. It's a, it's a really, this is an interesting question of how much you want to allow board members to interact with the staff, with superintendent and with staff members. There's actually one version of the VSBA policy that says something like, you know, the board staff um, relationships or board staff communication is um, encouraged, but, you, but the board doesn't tell them what to do. Right. And that's kind of confusing because it's really dicey. <laughs> <laughs> like, we are out there talking to them about what they do, but not tell. I mean, that's dicey. Um, so we, we had some discussion about that on the policy committee. And so this was a proposal to basically, you know, try to funnel um, requests for information through the superintendent. But that's a question. I mean, you could say that board members could ask for things from staff members too. Um, and I think actually it didn't make its way into the policy, but Steve and Ryan and I had talked about whether we might want to say something like if a board member is directing a request to the superintendent, they have to copy the board chair. Mm -hmm. So that the it's kind of like a check, like right. the board chair like knows what's going on. They're not a, a asking them for permission, but yeah. Do you all feel like this is a reasonable approach here? It, the idea here is that you're not prohibited from asking for something. But the superintendent needs to feel very com very comfortable saying, mm -hmm. "I just give you that," but that's going to take more time than you imagine, and I'm not going to be able to produce that, at least not in in a reasonable amount of time. And so, if you really want that, ask the rest of the board to to make the motion. Otherwise, yeah, it's, it's very clear. It says you can ask, but be prepared no. that he's going to yes, say I no. I think it's sometimes. clear. And it gives superintendent a little guidance to, to feel comfortable to say saying yes. no or yes, yes, depending on the standard. It says it's okay to ask, but he doesn't have to. Right. 
delivered. The word that the standard is significant, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is fine. <laughs> Just me. That's basically like anything, reasonable. by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's very hard. If it to takes get away any from effort at all, <laughs> to say no. It's Not today. Push. You say no. Whatever. <laughs> However, it does indicate that then the full board could be asked, and if the full yeah. board says yes, then the superintendent has to do it. What I like is that the chair is not the second step here. Right. Because it doesn't put the chair in the, in the place of acting on behalf of the board. Right. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It goes back Are to the full board. Which is what we talked about at the mm -hmm. retreat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Is good. All right. Keeping an eye on the time. Um, so, so that will come back to Oh, us. it's definitely going to come back. I mean, I, yeah. my vision on this, if others agree, is that we're going to have to have like a packet of them before we act on any of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like it's just really important right. that we, we kind of understand that this is going in the right direction. Yeah. We have to be thorough. Try to keep coming well, back and with more. As I think we've seen already, one sort of affects the next. Exactly. So you have to really know what we're thinking, they'll get easier as you go. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the conflict of interest and code of conduct are pretty related. I don't know if you want to talk about them together. Brian, sure, no, we could. I mean, I could give a little bit of the background, but yeah, as we're talking about these, do keep this in mind. So the, the board member's conflict of interest is a mandatory policy, required policy set forth by BSBA. Um, both of our districts have had that essentially adopted kind of status quo in the past. And then the board member of conduct, um, Roxbury had some code of conduct stuff set off by itself. The Montpelier policies had a lot a lot of the content in the code of conduct was included in most of the BSR, the Board Superintendent Relations of Policies in the Montpelier District. Um, so it's not new. It's also new. in 4.5, yeah. the governance policies. Yep. So it's yeah. not new, new, but it is kind of all combined by itself, a new policy. Um, and we did want to have a general discussion whether or not we felt that it made sense to keep these two things as separate policies or potentially combine them into one. But uh, so again, your conflict of interest policy, pretty straightforward, um, nothing too crazy there. The code of conduct policy kind of came to fruition. One of our first policy committee meetings, the kind of came up, you know, does this board need bylaws? Um, you know, Montpelier had a city charter, there was this, there was that, does it make sense? Do we need to essentially kind of um, reaffirm some of the things that were decided upon in the articles of agreement when we merged? And so I reached out to VSBA to get some guidance there, and they're like, no, the articles of agreement are good to go as they are. You know, you have your board terms, you have the number of people, how the votes, et cetera, are all taken care of. You can consider the articles of agreement your bylaws for the board, but you should really have how the board is gonna operate. You really need a code of conduct. Um, so a lot of the stuff, again, has been combined from the existing Roxbury and Montpelier information. But then a lot of the stuff also came from VSBA in terms of their best practices. So like the, what we included is the appendix, the declaration of commitment. That is literally verbatim from VSBA's essential workbook. Um, and that literally came out of their, their page. So this is straight from VSBA. Um, again, there's, there's a lot. It feels like it's kind of nitpicky. Um, but we figured, again, general discussion tonight, kind of get some guidance on how detailed we want to get with this. Um, if it's too over the top, if it's good, it gives us a structure, um, et cetera. So this is what we have to present and discuss. Peter? Okay. Well, first, as always, thank you for all the work. So anything I say, I thought that you could go in the limit and I hope making this better. So in the number two there at the top, um, we agree to avoid words and actions that create a negative impression on an individual, the board, or the district. So I'm fine with the part about the individual, but it seems a little constricting. Like, for example, am I not supposed to say at this meeting that I'm very disappointed, as an example, that the playground is very behind schedule and parents are upset and I'm upset too? I mean, that would be creating a negative impression of the district. on the border district. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's just saying that a project is behind schedule. You're not saying, like, this board is mismanaging the project. Okay. Well, that not might that seem, this that is might seem like a fine right. distinction. Okay, so let me just say for the <laughs> cameras and everyone else, I have, this is a hypothetical. Let me pick right. something else. Yeah. I am very disappointed that the board's management of the project to redo the baseball field is well behind, and I think we're dropping the ball. Like, to me, that is not 
necessarily that is that's mm -hmm. critical and in, in meant to inspire us to take action. Mm -hmm. I'm, but I am creating a negative impression of the board and the district on purpose because I believe we need to do better. So I, I mean, I think this is more about like going, you know, talking to your friends at the basketball okay. game and being like, I just feel like the board is terrible. Okay. But so, but you could see how it. Yeah, it, it does say read. in all situations the board. It does. It, it, there's a little to me that this infringes in a few areas on sort of the speech rights yeah, of an elected exactly. official, and I think you have to. I think we need to comb through it with that a little bit. I don't. I think there's most of this is fine and good, yeah. but the areas where it feels the most nitpicky are the areas where it's it's asking us to all be a team, you know, all sure. be like of one voice, and I think we have to be careful about that when we're elected. I mean, we talked about this at the retreat a little bit, and it's, you know, I, I think most of this is probably just fine, but there's a few of those spots that I think we so have the, to be careful. The current MPS policy says that individual members will make every reasonable effort to promote, to protect the integrity and promote the positive image of the district and one another, and never embarrass each other or the district. <laughs> Um, just to, I mean, just so you know, right. we're already, yeah. we're already, we're already on the other board. We're the bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that mean, but that Followed or not, that was. was <laughs> it doesn't mean it doesn't mean we need to. I just yeah, people right. should know that there, we already. Okay. Well, um, I think this the next sentence. It says, "While we encourage debate and differing points of view, we will do it with care and respect." So that's fine. That's if that's Peter's fine. going yeah. to say something about the baseball kid field, that's fine. He's just not going to yell at me at a board meeting no, and, and call not, me names. And, and that I, I actually with. don't object to a board member saying what you just said. And that, but, but, yeah. but I, don't I worry. Right. I worry about being told that I shouldn't be creating a negative impression yeah. of the board or district. Use of the weapon. Right. Yeah. And you could someone who is, let's just say mm -hmm. hypothetically. I was the only conservative member of this board, and everyone else is super out there. Mm -hmm. You all could use that against yeah. me because I'm creating negative impression on the board because I don't believe you all should be spending all this money sure. on mm -hmm. doing something. And like, I just worry that, I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but we are like no, it's proving important. this. Yeah. So yeah. I get to bring up my two other things, and we can move on, or we can, <laughs> I can keep beating this dead horse. <laughs> so I, that's all I have to say on that one. We could wordsmith it or I don't know. Did you have other points you wanted to? Well, down the list. I don't know. I don't want to skip past anyone else. Same other things before. Anyone else want to weigh in on the first couple? Mm -hmm. Do others? I, I heard Steve saying he shares that concern. Do others Not share that yeah, concern? I, actually, I hadn't even picked up on that one, but I think that's true. I was more down in section B. Yeah. And then also I have later section on. B and also. And I have, a sec I have section B comments, too. Actually, I'm thinking if even you eliminated that whole sentence that you don't like and just said, while well, we encourage debate and differing points of view, we will do it with care and respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like what Michelle said, though. Michelle, what Michelle said is what we should be doing. We should not be disparaging the district and the board. Right. We should not be doing that, saying, right. oh, this board is terrible. We're such a bunch of losers. Like, that's not <laughs> content. Or, things, or right? like, at a, similarly, I'm just going to keep using this basketball game context, but, you know, talking with other parents and like, oh, yeah, the district has a real problem with, you know, making, as, as parents, right. we are inclined to speak irresponsibly in social situations, but when we're on the board, we have to remember that. Right actually we kind of represent the district and we should speak supportively and, and not irresponsibly. It, I could not agree okay. more. But that, I don't know how you express that in a way that... Okay. So if, what if we came up with language that was less mandatory and more aspirational? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's, that was more about, you know, just we, board it. members aspire to or should... Be positive role models. Be positive. Yeah. Yeah. Strive to, to represent the district to. and... So that we know what we're trying to do, but we're not necessarily ordering Nobody people to do things. things. So, sure. But like as a smaller example, again, and I just to hone to put a little finer point because Michelle's mm -hmm. right. Like I'm sitting next to Brian, we're co-parenting, we're speaking out the board stakes. Like that is inappropriate. I think we all get that. But like for example, let's say with the example again that you all have gotten mm -hmm. super super liberal and I've gotten conservative, <laughs> and I went to a meeting of parents who are, share my politics and are very conservative. Want, and I would go, you know this board is out of line with Montpelier, and I want us to spend less money. And I think the board is way out of line with voters. Like, that's very negative. But mm -hmm. that is, to me, a reason, like Steve was saying, that's kind of a, a free speech 
like I want to get people to run for office and change the composition and do all that stuff. Like that should not be seen. That's not out of bounds to me. Maybe this is one of those Felix Frankfurter pornography things. Like you know pornography when you see it. Yeah. But maybe we can try to put words into it because there has to be a free speech element where we're trying to be constructive and do what I think is right for the board without disparaging its members. You know that kind of thing. Not the board itself. Um, so no ad hominem. Yeah, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Oh, go to the next one? Okay. So in section B, um, to be efficient and effective, long board meetings must be avoided. <laughs> I mean, you know. Michelle slipped that one in. I, I mean, no one likes long meetings, but. Some people less than others. <laughs> so I think what this is getting at. I mean, this, this is, we did not this? make this up. This is the SBA. Right. <laughs> we'll tell I'm pretty sure. No, um, actually. Somewhere. I think some of this came from Montpelier's. Mm -hmm. A lot of not that <laughs> no one. Doubt it. There's no way well, that one. We've never had that. But I think what this is getting at is a nice goal. I think what this is getting at is you should be keeping that in mind as a board member. Like it's not yeah. that sometimes the board might have so much work to do right. that the meeting right. is four hours, yes. but as you're participating in, in the board meeting, right. totally. you shouldn't just be yammering And I know on, that's on, what on, this on. means, <laughs> but, but when you read this right. wording, yeah. someone sure. could say, well, there's 74 people in the audience. We're not going to hear because right there, we yeah. signed the code of conduct. Long meetings avoided. Y'all go home. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all I'm saying. Like, we're not going to do like a filibuster thing here. Yeah. And we're not going to have like, yeah. but there has to be more clarity that the reason to avoid a long meeting is one person going on and on and on and on, right? And I think Bridget's point to, to help move this conversation along is that this could be written in sort of an aspirational. You know, I think yeah. I think Thank you. I think Bridget's. We want to respect board members' time and yeah. use the time right. effectively right. and try to handle Instead of questions. You know, yeah, I mean, individual even, questions outside of the meeting. Yourself, so even with this, yeah. with this um, section B one, instead of the word will, aspire to, or will try. You know, I mean, I think I agree that yeah. it's hard. You know, I look at the one that says to not interrupt each other. We try. Well, I mean, and bear in mind, also, it's not like there's any punishment. No, there's <laughs> no consequence. But I think, well, I, well, I hear Peter's point. Well, I will say on the on the, the third to thank you, Brian. But on the third page, I am asked to sign something. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which, is, which is it just says you're doing everything in your power to yep. be productive, and it doesn't say. And if I don't, I understand. But I just worry that if someone uses it against, and mm -hmm. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. So also on number three, the board will consider research, best practice, public input, and financial impacts in their decision making. And I worry, is this like an exclusive list? For example, Becky is an expert in HR, right? She has a lot of experience in human resource issues. Now that's not listed here, like personal experience well, isn't listed. In, and or interests of the students are not listed. Well, right, and so, <laughs> so there's a lot of things not listed, and I know we can't list everything, right. so it kind of concerns me to cut it off at these top five. And again, I know what everyone's getting at. We're trying to have some basis. We can't just say, well, today I feel like we should move left, and tomorrow we go right. Like, right. that's not, Well, I don't, in, in several of the other policies, we put in parens not limited to. Well, okay. the best practice would incorporate a someone's individual. Yes. Experience. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, right. that wasn't clear. So thank you. Well, That's yeah. very appreciative. And students' mm -hmm. yeah. um, educational interest. Or okay. Whatever. So I only have one more, but I'd like to note that I really don't comment on that many policies. So I feel like I'm getting a lot. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a super this is interesting great. policy. I do, right? and okay. so I just don't. I'm not going to go on like this for the next <laughs> five policies. You could. Well, I don't want to. <laughs> so on the appendix that, in theory, we're supposed to sign. I, maybe this is my hang up in that first paragraph, excellent return on investment for taxpayers. Yeah, mm -hmm. what does that even mean? I know what people are that getting is. at, like people feel like it's for the amount of money, like let's say we wanted to spend 30 grand a student, but all of our kids went to Ivy League, that's a great return. <laughs> like, okay. As a hyper, like, but that but not is not what we want to judge mm -hmm. anything by. Can, um, can I look back I'm up? I'm not sure I agree with that. I, okay. I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure about having that language in either, so I totally hear what you're saying, but did, this again, this this is the verbatim thing, right? From the, the central declaration. Recruit, the declaration. Yes. Yeah. 
do folks generally want to go down this road? I mean, to me, that the first question right. is, we, have, we, we never did this in MPS. I don't know if you did this in Roxbury. We oh, good. Did. I was trying to think, was, did I ever sign something yeah. that said no. something? No. <laughs> I don't know. If no. <laughs> it was when I saw, when I joined the board, it was signed. I have no idea if the past board members, Kate, came on after me. I don't know if it was brought forward again after that. To, I'm not sure how far it continued or when it kind of came into On the creation. Roxbury board? On the Roxbury oh, board. I was going to say, somebody asked you to sign this when right. you joined this board. So like I said, there's never been a day when somebody came up to the meeting and said, hey, Ryan, do you remember? Here's your declaration of commitment. Um, that <laughs> has been buried somewhere in a file for a long time. But I can see the pros and cons. And I think if we go down that road, Peter, we have to have a pretty robust discussion about what's in it. Right. But I, I guess I kind of want to start at, do people needed. think we should do this, then we should agree on some principles that we have members sign. What's the enforceability we, of it? And why are we signing it? That's, right. Yeah. I that don't think it's enforceable at all. I, does anyone think I don't no. think it's enforceable? No. But you can't get kicked and, off. And what if someone's elected and says, I don't think I want to sign right. it? How do you, yeah, um, right. That's my question. I don't think we can do anything about that either. Right. <laughs> and how, do, how does a board member get, I mean, what's the sanction? Is mm -hmm. there, can a board member be sanctioned in some way, Impeached. can they be removed from the board? I think really the only terrible. thing that comes with further process is a conflict of interest, yeah, so which is in the conflict of interest policy, and that, that is part of what's in here. You would be, you're signing off to agree. I mean, what yeah. if Becky punches you? Yeah, there should She's be some right consequence. Next to you. What if she mm -hmm. just gets so mad that she punches you? Like, <laughs> I mean, obviously there are civil There is no, we do not that. have the ability to remove people from the board. But that's what I'm asking. We don't. There's no mechanism for any right. kind of consequence. I don't, so, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, we're just yeah. outlining what we would all we like. All, all <laughs> why, sh why should we have the right to remove someone from the board. Well, it's the same, you know, no, I'm, I'm not elected. saying that, we, I'm not suggesting no. we should have that yeah. right. I'm asking whether there is a mechanism oh. to do it. We're not debating whether to insert it or this document. No, no, I mean, <laughs> well, like, the legislature does. Right. You can get rid of one of your members. You can. You can get rid of one? I was just yeah. going to say. We always lived in fear of that, actually. <laughs> Recently, yeah. there's been. It's McAllister coming That's more. true. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we so could have one, but we don't. I mean, I'm not sure that we could. We don't actually. Okay, maybe. No, I'm, I'm not sure that the steps would allow. Okay, us. good question, so, yeah. right? That's, well, that's in the constitution. That's that's fine. Fine. I, I, I don't feel the need to sign anything. I think when you sign, join the board, you read through the, you read through all these policies, and at some, and at some level, you agree to this member code of conduct, and, and that's your like your guiding light. And if you can't, you maybe know, people have to sign this when they turn in their petition. And if they're not willing to sign it, they can't. Can we, we can't impose that one. Yeah, I was going to say. Just be clear. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so um, really actually, in all of that, I suggest that we dump Appendix A. Yeah, right. Second, Becky, the content. Oh, Becky has a comment. I have a, I, have a, I have a comment. There is a reason to, if there's an unavoidable conflict of interest, say, if your husband is an architect bidding on a project here, you need to be able to publicly in some form or manner be able to say so Did and recuse that. yourself from the decision making. Do we have a process for that? Isn't that in here in the conflict in of interest? But, but, but I think we mentioned. should sign to it. I think the it should be identified interest. in some way and signed to it. it just so you're that saying you there should be a signing thing for conflict of interest, but not necessarily But not code of conduct. conduct. But for conflict so of interest. How does the board enforce that? Does Hold on, can I just understand this question? Are you saying that we th you think members should sign the code of the conflict of interest policy? Or the that conflict they, of interest should be or that the they public. Should, that, but that they should sign the policy or that when they have a conflict, they should sign something? In, in, and maybe this is weird to health care, but any place I've worked in the last 30 years, I've had to sign a conflict of interest document that in the last decade or so, I've had to reveal my husband was an attorney who occasionally took cases where oh, you the mean sign something disclosing disclosing what your a conflict are of interest, but also that you would disclose. Did you sign yes, that? and Did that you, you make a commitment hire? to disclose. Yeah, I had to sign one at my new job. And so I, you know, I, I think if we re restructure this declaration or make it a conflict of interest declaration, that would be sufficient. But if I was a member of the public, I would want to know if a member of the board's 
had a financial interest in the outcome of a decision of the board. So it's well, all this, true. The question is enforceability. So if the board has the authority to enforce something, then the so when you when you are when you are elected onto the board, we have a whole packet of policies. Yeah, we do. That you can ignore and every raise single your one of those policies because you've been elected. But you will become. But the board will simply uh, enforce it themselves. The question is, what is unenforceable by the board versus enforceable? And that, that's my concern. So um, the board can't enforce that you will uh, not play to the audience during a debate. I mean, they could try, I guess. They, they can, can they enforce conflicts of interest? How does the board enforce, if they just, we see this a lot where, where a, a elected member will not disclose a conflict. Everyone knows they have a that's conflict, right. they don't do it. Everyone's like, yeah, but they have a conflict and they're still voting. Yes. And how do yeah. we, do we as That's a board have, we a, have a policy. We have a mechanism for kicking for that person having, out of the vote? Well, we have a mechanism for having a hearing to decide there you go. whether there is a okay. conflict so of interest. That's good. And if we find yeah. that there is, then we would say that we find mm -hmm. it, Yeah. Right. Well, if we do that, then I think that's fine. Vote. And that's, that's statutorily enforceable. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Well, I think that's, that's in here, even if I didn't sign it, by the fact that it's policy, yeah. it says that if okay. there's a conflict of interest, I should be disclosing it. Also, right? some, of the, some of the language in the, that is in the Declaration of Commitment is maybe better than some of the language that's on the previous page on the code of conduct. And for folks on the policy committee, I would just say before we jettison Appendix A because of the offensive signature line, we should <laughs> review it because some of yeah. these things might oh, okay. be as a well worded. Yeah. So just rework it. No, there's definitely there's definitely overlap between the two. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's what we've said. It was a little bit unclear keeping them separate documents or keeping it in an appendix. So, yeah, if we want to scrap, and I guess is that the consensus of the board, the direction of the board on this is we'll scrap the, the declaration, use some of the better language, and then come up with just a general code of conduct? Yeah. I think that'd sure. be helpful. And do? I do think, I mean, I, we haven't talked about them too much. I, I just want to say that I, I think both B1 standards for how we engage at meetings, and I'm going to say, see yeah. commitment to the work of the school board. Yeah. You know that these things are important. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, that they should be in the policy. That we should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We might not be able to enforce them, but we yeah. should be monitoring yeah. and yeah. working mm -hmm. on improving. For example, the degree to which we have equal participation in a meeting and avoiding mm -hmm. people dominating a discussion and avoiding playing to the audience. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that we should be openly, I think, and candidly discussing what it means to, to be committed to the work of the board, what it means to be a participant in committee work and to come to meetings and to do work outside of meetings um, because that's that's kind of where the rubber hits the road. Um, Bridget, so, can yeah. I monopolize the meeting further? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, you with may. With the chair's permission. I, I, I'm gonna go back a, a, a step because I actually think it might be useful to sign it not with this, I would take out the sentence about agreeing to abide by it, but to sign it indicating that you've read it and that it might be worth um, for each new member who comes on, the chair should pull this out of the binder and be like, yeah. you really, I really want you to read this and, and show that you've read it. But I I might say that's part of procedure. We discussed a long time ago what we do for new board members. Yep. Who knows what we do? So th that might be part of the, the procedure for new Bev members is to say for every new board member, we're going to for sure take out these three policies, whatever they might be, and say, we'd like you for sure to read these. These are our things. expectations. Yeah. Read it, sign it, return it to the superintendent so that we know that we, so that when I later say, you know, Tina, you've got to stop doing X, and you say, well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. Yeah. Right. Okay. No, it's a good idea. I had some more thought yeah. in the discussion, too. Um, just the, my last one is the first bullet. Just seems a little hokey. Recognize that a board member's responsibility is to see that schools are well run, but not to run them. <laughs> Like, I think the VSBA is a lot of Yeah, that's, that's VSBA right there. <laughs> okay. They're the VSBA. We're not. Like, I don't know. I, 
just okay. not, no. is not yeah. really something I'm really willing to yeah. commit to. We've talked about all this other stuff, but that's just, it's just weak. There's, in, the, in the appendix A, the first thing about, and this is the thing Peter objected to, um, which I don't think I object to, but I want to be clear. Um, basically, this goes back again to things we learned at VSBA about there's really two things we do. One is we take care of the students, and the other is we take care of the taxpayer, basically, or the owner. And the idea here is that we're going to always do what's in the best interest of the students, but always balance it with getting a really good return on, on the dollar we spend. So, you know, that's not really codified anywhere in terms of the actual mission of a school board member, I don't think. Like, I don't think that says that in state statute about why we're being elected. And um, if that really is our, our mission statement for each of us individually, our role, um, I, you know, I don't know. But that's what this is effectively saying, and that's what we hear over and over again. And I think that's what this is attempting to say here is, don't forget that this is your role as a board member, yeah. is to do this thing, which is look out for okay. students and look out for taxpayers. So that's it. That's all. I just don't know how to word it any better. All some things. The, it's the term return on investment that bothers me. I don't. It's a finance term. It yeah. is. ROI is. It's. It's. Yeah. It's. A, it's. It's. It's not the right wording. I mean, yes, I believe we should be looking at. I believe we should be counting paper clips. I do. Like, I want to know where every dollar is spent, and we are accountable for that. But to think of like these kids as a return on investment. So like. Do we measure them when they're 24? Yeah. Like, so, like, so did I get my so money's it's more worth like there? Stewardship but, no, but, but, for but really, everything. like, you may have a class of kids who are just not that great. Not that many go to college, but all of them go to Votech or become, you know, and like, right. that's a great return on investment. Which taxpayers thinks that's good? Which don't? Like, right. who are we talk about? Like, it's just a How weird term for me to use. Like, mm -hmm. it's a strange to, to commit to. Yeah. But yes, we should be conscious of all of our decisions how we're spending taxpayers' money. We need to do that. But that's a, ROI is not the term that I'm comfortable with. So, but I, I agree with Steve, right? Those are the people we are serving, not just students, right? We're serving all taxpayers. Actually, I would even argue we're not even serving all taxpayers. We're serving all residents of Montpelier. There are people right. in Montpelier who don't pay taxes, but still true. are part true. of our community. Yeah, that's very true. Was that all a discussion in all helpful to the policy committee? I thought it was fascinating. Yeah. I feel <laughs> no. like we a, definitely. We could expect a good long conversation on this one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's about what we're doing. Um, I, I would also just add that folks should feel free to you know, follow up after okay. the meeting. Time. Edits or anything like that. I've used up all my words for the evening. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't say that. You don't Somebody have any edits on the up? budget execution box? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, okay, so we also had on for second reading substitute teachers, fiscal management, budget mm -hmm. execution, volunteers, and work study students. Those were really only on for second reading and not adoption because of the glitch around public posting tonight. Yet. So I have a comment about the substitute teachers. All right. That and that is, it says nowhere in here that you have to have a background check. And you did say that for volunteers, and I think you should say that for substitute teachers. Isn't Isn't that a law? In, I'm sorry. I thought it was covered in another policy. Well, it, There's it, no, I mean, it does say so in volunteers. It says you have to... Anybody who's in a teaching position has to have a back. I mean, there's anyone who is has unfettered access to children at any time must can only do so with a background check. Under which policy? Right, but I'm saying under we don't state, state, state law. it under state law. It's state law. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't have to, because if you're a substitute teacher, it is state law that if I put you in front of a classroom, you have a background check. And the only reason it, do, it says specifically for volunteers is because you are not a teacher, and so I have you're to do that for hired. you. You're, I'm not hiring you, and so I'm not paying you, but if I'm gonna give you unfettered access to children, you do have to have a background check. If I have a volunteer who's in the presence of an appropriately background checked uh, educator or member of the NPS, who's an NPS employee, I don't need a, a background right. check for that individual. So it's state law, which is why it's not stated for substitute teachers. Okay, as long as we do it. Oh, did, that is, <laughs> if you recall, and I'm sure you do, um, last year's Act 166 debacle 
was certainly around the fact that I was one of, and my colleague Lori Gossens, who's in the room, was another, who said, uh-uh, I'm not, I don't care that I'm holding up your money, I don't care that I'm, and I did, but the principle was, I don't care that you're not getting your money, this person right here, I don't know that he has a background check, and I'm not gonna release public dollars for a public school student to go into a private pre-K if I don't know that every single person in that private pre-K has been appropriately background checked. And not only it relates that, it was the same kind of thing, like all of a sudden, because when this became law, background checks did not go through with any uh, regularity and that I remember that first year of backup of background checks and you had all these teachers already hired and nobody had a background okay. check. So yes, we're, I, I, that is done and done. Quick question, process question. Um, when we hire teachers of course we do the background checks, are they rechecked? Periodically? So we don't know. No. It's what lawyer you said? We do not, as the employer, right. recheck, do background checks, but teachers are required to do that when they're licensed. Yes, 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 thank you. Okay. That, so good. they have That's to every time. Thank you okay. for reminding Great. me of that. I knew good. there was something Thanks. there. Good question. Mm -hmm. Anything else on those four policies? So can I be clear that since, um, and for those who are um, following along on TV, if you go to our website, <coughs> mpsvt.org, and go under Montpelier Board of School Commissioners, and go to MRSD Policies, there is a web page called Policies in Process, and all of the policies that we are working on are there. Um, in their entirety and can be reviewed and um, commented on by the public. And if anyone is having trouble accessing them for any reason, they should certainly feel welcome to contact me in the office at 223-9796 or brian at mpsvt.org. And I'll be happy to get you a copy of any policy, electronically, hard copy, or otherwise. War that's that's so Warford. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> five two. Five two. Good. Whatever. Okay. With that. Like yeah. okay with that. So that will be substitute teachers, substitute. fiscal management, budget execution, volunteers, and work study students. Change to show. Did we change back to will? Sure. Did we do? Did we do that wrong? I thought that was in my notes. Um, it was in the notes to change shall to will on the volunteer policy, which you did. Sorry, I thought that that was um, across the board. Sure. Well, no, no, it's across the board. Changing shalls to will. Okay. Not wills to shall. Got it. So could I ask okay. for clarification to this, please? I tried to figure that out from the notes, but couldn't. So oh, you weren't at the meeting. I wasn't at yes. the meeting. Okay. So the, I'm just curious for a brief explanation of the multi-grade K-4 elementary. I remember why it was a Roxbury thought about that. So where are we now on that? That it's by classroom, but I'll let you know. Right, so we, Lori and I spent a lot of time on this and tried to run as many numbers to reasonably account for how best to support the diverse numbers that we could potentially see in Roxbury, including a class, or including a grade cohort that could have as few as zero. Yeah. And as many as say, what were we thinking, Lori? Like 10 or 12, right? Yep. Um, and so we decided instead of doing it by grade, we would do it by classroom. And with the caveat that no teacher will have more than two consecutive grade levels per classroom. So this top portion here is simply for the, the one right here is simply for oh, the Roxbury okay. Village School. So in the K-4 okay. school, the minimum average number of students per classroom would be eight. Optimum, we're saying, is 10 to 12. And in order to account for every mathematical possibility, we're doing less than or equal to 40, which we feel would right. <coughs> satisfy okay. any permutation. 
And the way that we will do this to satisfy both reasonability and educational outcomes is that no teacher will have more than two consecutive grade levels per classroom. So for example, you could not one, two, have three, one, I two, could. and three. Okay. And that was really put in to replace this yes, there, it right? Is. Because okay. we didn't feel we felt that in order to con uh, in order to support the most um, a good policy with a lot of viability for a smaller school, rather than doing it by grade, because Lori and I just could never get around how to do it by grade with the numbers as as we were projecting them. Like it would not, it just simply wouldn't work. And I think it was Lori who said, "What if we just do it by cl like physical classroom, <coughs> yeah. and that'll actually make all of these numbers work?" So that was the rationale behind mm -hmm. making that change. Uh, on the back page, third paragraph, I would like you to consider some uh, a, pra a phrase at the beginning of the last sentence that starts, the principal has. See where I am? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Would you consider the following phrase? After considering online platforms and dual enrollment options, the principal has the discretion to approve these course offerings. That's a pretty big change there after considering online. What, uh, and now, so here are my two points. Okay. And I, I did talk to my about this. That um, all you're saying is consider. Yeah. After considering online platforms and dual enrollment options. In other words, I'm just saying, um, actually, I will say that we are doing <coughs> great at this. The, um, the percentages are up. Um, I think we are doing this now. And so I actually did stop in to talk to Mike about this because I didn't want to say anything that indicated I didn't think he was doing a great job. I think he is. I just think that it's um, the reason I thought about it was we haven't always done a good job at this. <laughs> and I thought maybe writing it down would help us. Others? So now. You know, I mean, it, I don't mind considering anything. I just don't know what are all the things we should be considering. You know, is this is this this is a this is a narrow list based on, I think a a, um, a value <clears throat> or a priority of that we should we should be doing more of this. I'm not opposed to doing more of that, but I'm concerned that are we just singling these things out and I haven't had a second to think about what other things should we be considering so that we're not um, making a special point on maybe one or two, two things, things out of five or seven we should be considering. I don't know, but I do think this is a value statement that we throw in to a document that's maybe has a few value statements in it. But, you know, I, but I'm just saying that I, mean, I think the idea is to give it some some numbers here and I don't know. I mean, I'm not opposed to it, but I'm opposed to it until I have a chance to think about what other things we would mm -hmm. want to consider too. I'm also not opposed to doing a broader after consideration of, meaning yeah. consider something before doing this. So one concern I have in terms of the timing, I mean, we don't have to ad adopt it next the next time, but is, um, this is the third reading, and and before we, you know, there was a process of getting input from all the principals on the language that we brought to the first reading, and I'm reluctant to change it and adopt it without having a chance to go back to the principal involved and get some input on the oh, changes yeah. because, you know, that's that was part of the development of the policy, and that's the person I think who would have the most uh, input from the from the leadership team mm -hmm. side, yeah. So I think if we were gonna make a change like that, I, I, I would wanna at least do that step first. What the others? I think, I think that's appropriate. So are we directing the principal to do something if with that statement? That other, yeah. yeah, if we had this other language, we are, right. I think. And that's kind of stepping outside of our realm in terms of how we're supposed to be interacting with that. staff. I mean, granted, it's in policy, but still, I mean, I guess you could say our policies limit other staff members also, besides just a superintendent, but it feels a little bit more heavy-handed in terms of telling somebody else besides the superintendent what to do or how to do it. 
Would it be helpful to have something broader to the extent that the language could be proposed to Mike after considering other alternatives? I mean, I get the spirit where you're trying to go with I'm this, okay with, yeah. you know, and so that it's not, because this also goes to kind of Steve's point before about, I guess and Michelle's too, about the reasonability of the interpretation of the policy. So if you're looking to be less heavy handed, perhaps, you know, Mike might consider whatever I just said, after thoughtful consideration of alternatives. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's not just a, hey, I've got discretion to go below the minimum. Uh, the bar is that, you know, and however it's reasonably construed, I considered these alternatives. And for this reason, and this reason, this reason, it didn't necessarily fit in the mission or values or, or how about that. Because then it kind of gets okay. to what you're thinking about, but it also doesn't say you have to think of these two things as well. Would that be? Uh, yeah. I, that said, your timeline is, is a reasonable question, too. So I, I'm just going to split the difference here. And Ryan, usually in policy, we don't even refer to the principal. Right. Because we refer to the superintendent. Right. That is true. We could just delete that whole sentence. Well, I think if we deleted the sentence, that would really change the meaning of the policy. Okay. I mean, Trying to, yeah. we're trying to specifically yeah, say you can saying. bring the minimum average yeah. below. Bye. Well, I, th I thought the sentence before that said that, but <clears throat> I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure the second sentence is clear enough to okay. to to say it's okay if the minimum average drops below. Okay. In that content area. Any other comments on this? Um, so we can get a reaction about that proposed language. So I have two proposals there. After considering online platforms and dual enrollment or after considering other alternatives. Uh, I mean, I prefer the more general language, I think. Mm -hmm. But we'll get some reaction and put this one back on for next week. Mm -hmm. Can we do yeah. next week? We, uh, uh, yes, because it's not being adopted. Sure. It's not being adopted. That's so. absolutely. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. 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 Ryan, out of uh, procedural, do you want to try to get the in district elementary school transfer policy on for the 11th, or do you want to wait till the 2nd? And I'm okay either way. I think I could probably come up with a draft. Bridges, Steve, do you guys think you'll have a chance to? Yeah. Go through some iterations in the next week. Yeah. So you'll need it by Friday, Friday. which is two days from now. Yeah. Okay. You want to shoot? Why don't we shoot for the second? Let's let's keep it Probably reasonable. Probably more reasonable. Let's that. keep yeah. it yeah. reasonable. I was thinking Wednesday. Yep. <laughs> Third reading will be on five two. Okay. okay. All right. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. And you'll just give me feedback on how you want to put the language in, or you mean even just send that to Mike. I think that's fine. So, thanks everybody. Um, Thank you. Anyone have anything to raise before we adjourn? Thank you for all your hard work. Yeah, it's so well, Thank you. Thank Thank you for running such a tidy meeting. Uh, One minute. All right, a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.